Okay, um, 11 o'clock on a Sunday, first Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Chai and Why. Thank you all for coming to Prithvi Theatre. It's great to see people back in person. Uh, please do come for this and other events. Uh, before I start with uh, welcoming today's uh, speaker, let me tell you for those who are coming for the first time, I see some new faces here. Uh, Chai and Why happens on the first Sunday of every month, 11 o'clock at Prithvi Theatre over here. On the third Sunday of the month at Ruparel College in Matunga. And on the fifth Sunday of the month, and this month uh, has a fifth Sunday, yes. So uh, that one is going to be a special thing from TIFR to be an online session, probably. Uh, we are usually at Alexandra School, but we are not still sure whether the school is going to uh, host us or not. Uh, so these are our standard programs. We try and provide a mix of different topics through the year. Uh, the programs, the next one, two weeks from now at Ruparel College, will be a, a sort of Chai and Y exploring the world of electricity and magnetism, doing simple experiments with magnets, batteries, wire, whatever else. It's going to be a more of a hands-on session uh, aimed at everybody, small kids, big kids, kids at heart, everyone who wants to play with magnets and batteries and, and wires and things like this. That's electricity and magnetism experiments coming up two weeks from now at Ruparel College. And a month from today, August 7th, the first Sunday of August, we're going to be back here with a Chai and Y on the topic of uh, related to astronomy. It's looking at how black holes merge together and get gravitational waves and things like this. So it's, a, it's going to be on black holes and black hole mergers that's happening uh, on August 7th. Uh, we will have uh, Shaurav Chatterjee uh, from TIFR uh, giving that session over here. The sessions at Prithvi, it's very easy to do uh, online on YouTube uh, because it's usually just a speaker speaking. Of course, uh, online audience welcome, but you don't get chat. Uh, and uh, uh, the ones at Ruparel, if it is a hands-on session where we're doing experiments at different stations, it's really difficult to do that on YouTube. So please come in person for that one. Uh, so with that, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, Presenter Shudipto Maithi, come on Shudipto, let the online audience see you. So for the online audience, you have to be here. Uh, Shudipto is a, a sort of, has done many Chai and Ys. Uh, he is an old hand at this. Shudipto is a person who, according to him, applies techniques of physics, especially optics, to look at problems in biology while being in a chemistry department. Okay. And Peter, uh, where's the so, Jack of all fields. Yeah, Shudipto is from, uh, started off his life from IIT Kanpur, I think, then moved to Cornell, Penn, and found his way back to TIFR, is a senior professor and knows everything about, a little bit about proteins, how they come together, how they do things, how you use fancy optics and microscopy, etc. But today he's going to tell us about something about a world of cells and the inside and the outside and what's between and things. Membranes. Like so membranes. The, okay. Over so, all over Shudipto. Somewhat. Okay, so, so if you if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and he'll see you. If you're online and you want to ask a question, please put it in the chat uh, and we will either take it after the thing or we will, we are monitoring the chat. We can interrupt Shudipto as well. Please come in and sit down. Please come in, please come in, come in and sit down. Uh, yeah. And of course, what we will do is, the way we do this is, uh, unless you have a very important question, let's save it till the end. Uh, we will uh, do this. Uh, we will stop the online transmission once we go out for chai. Sorry, guys, if you're online, you don't get the chai and you don't get the discussion we have over chai outside. Uh, the second part where we come back and we'll have a chat amongst ourselves, that's not going to be online. Okay, so that's the way we do it. All right, so this is the best we can do in the hybrid world. Uh, so all over, over to you, Shudipto. Let me just check that. Uh, Fantastic. This. Yeah, and if you can't hear, can't think all the things, please, uh, I hope you are unmuted yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think my head is going to get cut off. Yeah, I, I, I'll adjust till, it. I'll do it. I'll do it. So, uh, till, yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Glad to be here. Glad all of you are here on a Sunday morning in the monsoon. And glad to see you. And uh, of course, also the uh, the fact that uh, we haven't had Chai and Wise and on any public gatherings for a long time. Because Chai and Wise probably started about a month or two ago in person. 
So we're so glad. You know, go to any conference, scientific meetings. Everybody asks, is this your first one? Of course, they don't mean, is this your first scientific meeting? We've been doing scientific meetings for the whole life. But all they mean is that the first one of the pandemic. So we started in February uh, from a conference and uh, I've been meeting a lot of friends. And this is another set of friends I'd love to meet and people who are interested in science. And this is so important to get the conversation uh, going and running between one of the institutes, which I like to believe is one of the top science institutes of the world, which happens to be right in Bombay. So it's uh, good to have a good conversation between uh, the world, which is just outside uh, of our institute and not being in the ivory tower. And for that, can't thank um, enough uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Arno. And uh, I'm so glad you won't uh, know for, by looking at him and uh, the amount of time he spends on this, that he's also now the director of uh, the uh, institute, uh, which is part of TIFR, which uh, actually um, is about teaching of science. Okay, so whom you have a center for science education. And I'm sure that his abilities to reach out to the community now will actually uh, really uh, get the scale. He is very passionate about this. So, and uh, let's get back to this uh, talk now. Share screen. I'm share screen. Share screen. Okay. Yeah, it's not for long. Okay. Can everybody see in the online? I hope that. This I hope will get out. This will minimize by itself, I hope. Which one? I'll just, put it uh, just go to the three dots and hide floating. Hide device. floating this thing. Hide floating. Me yes, and we have your thing on YouTube as well. No problem. Okay. Good. Let's start. So today I wanted to talk about something that we have been very, very interested in in the last two or three years. Okay. Usually, as Arnab said, I'm interested in the world of proteins. The small molecules which make up your muscles and lots of other stuff that your cell does. The cell has a boundary. In fact, it defines what is in for the cell and what is out. What is the living being, if you take a single cell, and what is the non-living world outside. And the boundary is not some inert boundary like most of these boundaries of a room are. They are much more interesting because the cell is to communicate through the boundary. And this boundary is, you know, obviously made a lot of, about, you know, made of uh, fat and fat-like molecules. I'll introduce you to that. There's a very important thing there. All of you, even if you haven't word, worried about cells, uh, many of you I'd say, have worried about what is there in that boundary. Because you know about fat, you know about um, obesity, you know about um, atherosclerosis, which is uh, something that, uh, you know, blocks your arteries. And you have heard about cholesterol. You have heard, heard probably about omega-3 fatty acids, trans fats, and things like that. What to do, what not to do, what to eat, what not to eat. So all of those I will talk about during this talk and we'll put it in a format where you'll be able to understand it exactly how they come in. It's much better to understand the basics of science than just listening to people, hey, don't eat that, that's good for you, that's bad for you, etc. Just go through. So stay with me. And I will say that if you raise your hand, if you really have a question, please do it. I'll stop and uh, do it. I'll finish in time. Don't worry. It's more important that I get the messages across, the basic things across, than actually trying to for me to finish the talk. Okay, so we'll hear about all of this. I'll tell you about the boundary, how it forms, uh, what kind of molecules go in there, why are those molecules there at the boundary. Then at the end, if I get a little time, I'll tell you about nuggets of new things that you're finding in our lab. Okay, so some of by some of the people who are sitting in the audience, a couple of my students. All right, let's start. So. Okay. So we'll start from the scale. That's our scale. And we'll try to talk, to talk about things or beings or molecules slowly that like water and that don't like water. There's a very, very strong connection to this 
uh, of this to the way the cell boundary is ended. So you know animals, which some like water, some hate it, and I just grabbed it from uh, somewhere. Uh, and it shows that even if you have a lot of water and you have land animals, these animals actually very rarely you'll find them in water. Okay, and you have all these uh, things, uh, the kids here and the kids at heart here who draw these things. They're land animals. They like land, they like the air, and they hate water. Reverse. One words. You have water, aquatic animals. You can have some land, of course, very little land in this cartoon, but you will hardly ever find them. They love water. They hate the air or hate the land. Okay. Up to this is perfectly fine. All of you know about it, but there are these interesting creatures. Amphibians. You'll sometimes find them in water, sometimes find them on land. That's a frog. Um, not far from here, uh, uh, where I used to take my children for uh, an outing, the, the zoo, it has hippos. The hippos are funny creatures because most of the time, actually, you'll find them on in water, except their nose, the part that they need to, uh, that love air, their nose would be sticking out of the water. Sometimes you won't even see them. So it's an animal, part of it loves water, the body loves water, but the nose, the head part, loves air. Okay, so it's not an amphibian, but I'm telling you about um, animals and people which are partly like water, partly they hate water. That's very important because now I'll take you to the molecular. Are there amphibian molecules? We'll come to it. First, let's uh, understand molecules that love air or liquid. And here I will make three different types. You have, don't go too far. Okay, don't. Go. Um, you have uh, molecules which are gaseous, right? Nitrogen, oxygen. But I'll start, start with something which is just carbon and hydrogen, methane. Okay, you see this here. That's a molecule. That means it has an atom of carbon. There's four hydrogen atoms in white, carbon is in black. That's a gas. Now, methane in the atmosphere to some extent causes greenhouse uh, warming and all that. People have heard about it. But this probably the simplest carbon containing molecule that you can see. CH. C, H. It's gaseous because it has no attraction. When things are gas, they don't, two molecules don't like to attach to each other. A lot of them attach to each other, they'll become liquid. They attach strongly, they'll become solid. So they don't like to each other because there is no particular attraction for another methane, for one. Okay. Let's extend this chain. Each has four bonds, the carbon has four bonds, and you have A and ethane. Yeah, it looks like that. There are two pictures. One lets you understand the bonding. The other is really what it really looks like. So you have two carbons now, and you have ethane. Still, no attraction to each other. There is no reason to get attracted to each other. You know, where do you get? Uh, what are the forces that attract uh, each other? Of course, human beings is a different thing. We'll not get into that. But for molecules, it's typically you know electrical charges, electrical. And they don't have any reason. They're neutral molecules. They have no reason to get it. Go forward. Two, three, four, you know, propane, butane, etc. Get to pentane. And this, I mean, winter body in Bombay will be liquid. He said, wait a minute. What? How did things change? They're neutral molecules. And they remain neutral. They are, all their bonds are satisfied. You have the H's and all that. Where is this certain attraction that they become liquid at uh, reasonably close to the, the boiling point of this is 15 or 20 or something. So it will be liquid. Now, yes, they are neutral molecules, but the world of atoms and electrons you may have heard in this uh, giant pie kind of things is dynamic. So occasionally there are fluctuations. You know, you have the nuclei, which are positively charged, electrons, which are negatively charged, and you have fluctuations which make it occasionally a plus charge here and a minus charge here. And if two molecules come together, say two molecules are pentane, then the fluctuating charges sometimes cause an attraction. 
So this is called the source has a funny thing. European name Van der Waal. Mr. Van der Waal farmers says this is called Van der Waal. So what am I talking about? This is one molecule. Let's say one molecule. Take with another molecule. The fluctuating charge. Delta is small charge. Okay, not one full charge. Fluctuating charges, and you have delta plus, delta minus. Okay, if there is a delta plus on this side, then delta minus on that side because overall the molecule is neutral. And another neutral molecule can have a delta minus, delta plus interplay of these. So creates this fleeting uh, centers of attractions. And that's why when you grow enough, there are enough of these that build up that two uh, pentanes coming together, if they're very close, they're fleeting, they're not very long range, and they're very close, they will attract each other. So pentane starts becoming a liquid at uh, the wintry mornings. And then you have hexane, which is liquid in normal temperature, room temperature, even here. And then you have, of course, hexane is six carbons, hex, then heptane, and you know you can go to decane, dodecane, or whatever. And all those would be liquid. And if you go up to 15 or 17, they will start becoming soft. That's what I'm saying. That in the world of molecules, you have gaseous things, you have liquids. There are two types of liquids. There is one type which are not charged or do not have uh, charge distributions that are permanent. They're fleeting charge distributions and they can attract each other weakly. So at if there are large enough surfaces, little bit of weak fractions will, the totality will give you a little, because there will be enough attraction. But still, these are the things which longer chains of carbons would be constituting uh, what we call oil. So these are oily substances when the chains are long enough. They're liquid, they have plenty charges. Okay, let's look at something which is more common to us. You have a question? Yeah. This point you mentioned is uh, ethane used in uh, petroleum. Yes. So petroleum, something that actually has a contains a lot of these things. At no, normal room temperature and pressure up to, uh, you know, the, in room temperature being 30 degrees up to maintain would be gaseous. But when you take out the petroleum, some different things that can come out. Natural gas has a lot of these. Petroleum has a lot of these. But these are the things which are, they're called hydrocarbons. The sources of energy, why? I'm not going to go into that because they can be burned. This carbon hydrogen things can become carbon dioxide and that burning gives you energy. And that's what you use in our uh, cars or uh, in our uh, cooking gas. And uh, yes, very much so. So thanks for that question. That's the answer. Yes, it's in the middle. Come back to water. People know this, right? H, two H's, H2O. We all live. That's what I like to sip occasionally here. So that's a liquid. But look at the size. That's like the size of a methane. Why is methane a gas? In fact, up to almost 20 in a gas. As I told you about this fleeting charges, it doesn't have to be fleeting in water. Oxygen is something that loves grabbing electrons. It's a selfish guy, takes electrons from the hydrogen, partially, not the full electrons. Partially. So you have a permanent delta minus and a permanent delta plus on that. Clear? So what was the fleeting thing and a weak effect here is a stronger effect here. Now, hydrogen bond, which is between this fleeting negative charge and the fleeting positive, not fleeting, permanent negative the polarized, you know, this is called polarized molecules because you create poles, positive pole, negative. A polarized molecule minus, is molecule plus, that hydrogen has an attraction. It's like, yeah, I have my own uh, parts, I'm still attracted to that guy because my behind is uh, seeing that guy. And then that guy is attracted to a third guy. Soon you have a network and this network condenses into water in the natural temperature. Obviously, <laughs> above zero or below 100 degrees Celsius. So that's why water, even though it's such a small molecule, is liquid. That's how you know, the whole of 
living thing, you know, the whole of evolution depends on the fact that the water is liquid at the time, normal temperatures or not. Okay. So these are called polarized molecules, or in short, polar. What I told you is something which is non-polar, those carbon chains with hydrocarbons are non-polar, and the water is a polar. Okay. This is the very basic thing in chemistry, the two kinds of liquids that you have. One is oily, the hydrocarbons, and one is polar, water-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In previous, more clearer, I said, why is that positive, positive, and negative? How does it know? Though? Oh, okay. So this will have to, this explanations will have to go to the basics of chemistry. Um, it depends on the shell, the way the electrons are arranged around the nucleus. And uh, it will love to have that eight number, the magic eight number. So it grabs an electron partially. So this is sort of a short answer. But really to get the right answer instead of this hand waving, you have to just do some quantum mechanics, calculate it, and you'll see this. So yes, it comes from the basic nature of the quantum thing that uh, you know, see this. And the hydrogen. So hydrogen will lose a little bit of water will gain it. Uh, Oxygen will gain it, so it's negative because it's an electron is negatively charged. So uh, oxygen becomes positive. Uh, oxygen becomes negative. The point is, I told you about polar and non-polar. Remember that because that's sort of very basic of uh, uh, the chemical definition of solids, polar and non. -polar. Let me get to uh, when I put them together. Oil in water. Any guesses to the mix? So this slightly politically incorrect cartoon says, hey oil, wanna hang out? Because I can't mix with you guys. <laughs> They're true. Those molecules are hydrophobic. Phobia is fear. So the oil-like molecules, the carbon chains, can't mix with uh, water. I'll give you a little bit of an explanation. It's called the hydrophobic effect. And so the oil would never mix. Why? The explanation is here. Okay. So imagine you have some little drop of oil or little molecule, a few molecules of oil. This thing, okay? And you have the molecules of water making their network, right? The hydrogen of one talks to the oxygen of the other, the oxygen of this talks to the hydrogen of the other. So they make this network. They love making these networks, but they can't make it with the oil molecule. Because there are no polar, you know, such uh, permanent charge separations. So they make hydrogen bonds with themselves, excluding the little one. So if they put a little oil, you know, one molecule or a couple of molecules, they will go into water, but they will stay there slightly unhappy. The water is also unhappy because it cannot just reach everywhere. It has to reach around that. But if you put a lot of oil in water, what will happen is that instead of having this little areas of frustration, a little bit of oil here, a little bit of oil here, a little bit of oil there, the frustration of water is minimized. It's something called free energy. You don't have to worry about it. It's minimized if it grabs all of that oil, the oil comes together, not that, uh, not because the oil loves each other, though there's a little bit of attraction, the van der Waals, but because the water love each other and they want to minimize this disturbance. So oils coalesce, the oil, little oil molecules coalesce to give you an oil drop. That's the standard state. Oil will slowly coalesce and form it. It will separate out from the water. This is called the hydrophobic effect. Phobia is fear. So there's a hydrophobic effect. And you see why oil doesn't mix water. They tend to separate out. They tend to be close to each other. Not so much for liking each other, but more because the water is forcing them. That's where, uh, uh, sorry, you said the bulk end. Yeah, so if you have a lot of oil, the, that's not a stable state. You can sort of mix them, okay? Vigorously mix them and then see little oil droplets. But if you wait for a long time, you'll see the dro droplets will come back. A little bit of, uh, you know, one molecule or two molecules will stay, but uh, that's not the stable state. Now we come back to where I started. Amphibian molecules. 
okay amphibian uh, uh, animals but this chemistry right can easily create molecules and nature has also created suppose we have a long okay, which i have presented now just we have the carbons imagine two hydrogens carbon two hydrogen carbon two hydrogen the long chain is oil it's oil but on the head of the oil is uh, i have added charge something that's very polar oh. remember the hippo it wants its nose in the air the rest of the body is very happy in water. Similarly, this body is happy in oil and this body is happy in water. And it's real frustration, real confusion. Where do you go if you put such a molecule in water? So you have polar heads, parts, and hydrophobic tails. Very interesting amphibian molecules. They're called amphiphiles. Amphiphilic molecules, they're really amphibian molecules. They are very interesting and very important. If you put them in water, this is what happens. You could have guessed. It. So the heads will love to see water. Okay, so they stick out. So the heads are the green ones. They stick out in the water. The whole thing is water. The blue thing is water. This is a bunch of these molecules which are amphiphilic, and they come together in a way that the yellow tails, which are hydrophobic tails, they are close to each other. Forming kind of a droplet, but the heads, they're oriented, they are not random because all the heads would love to face one. And there is just a cross section, so imagine it's a sphere. You have made what is called a micelle. Okay, so amphiphilic molecules can make micelles. Okay, that's very interesting, it looks very exotic. No, it's not very exotic. Throughout the pandemic, we are washing our hands <laughs> with what? With soap. This is soap. This is your soap. Why does it take dirt out? Why does detergent take dirt out of? Very simple. Because you typically have dirt that a simple water wash cannot clean off in um, because it's oil. So that's some sort of stain which is again hydrophobic, which found some oil, because there's always oil on the cloth. You know, your body sheds oil and you have, look at my collars and all, it's not going to be as clean as the rest of the chart, because there's a lot of oil that uh, comes out. The stain actually sticks there if you water wash is not going to take it off, because it's nicely covered in that ball that it makes, a lot of oil. But when the detergent comes in, it can grab that droplet of oil inside it. Because its whole area, yellow area, is hydrophobic. The oil will love to get in. The oil has the dirt in. But this is not going to clump together because this has a very nice water loving surface. They are not going to clump together like oil did. They will be floating around in water. This is what soap is. They grab the dirt, floats around in water. You give a wash, wash it. It has taken off the dirt. Okay. Okay, this say this is dirt particle, it will come in and grab it and it will take it off and you can wash it off. This is very important. As detergent. Okay, something that we are all familiar with. Now, more interesting stuff than the detergents right, are things just similar. It has a polar head group. This is another representation of use. You see, okay, it's not really well focused, but anyway. This is a charged area. There is a plus charge, there's a negatively charge. But these are these long tails you have seen before. So, this is again those amphiphilic molecules. This is non polar hydrophobes, and that polar, which, are, which is love to be in one. Except now I showed you one chain for the detergents. You can have multiple chains. Okay, and you know, large areas in the head. So, still very similar to soap, but we start calling them things which are actually combined in. Our bodies generally call polar lipids. So these are lipids and another big name for uh, another fancy name for what is basically hydrophobic region, hydrophobic tail, and you have a polar head group. Okay. These are the stuff I'm coming close to what makes up uh, the fat in your the fatty layers in your body and what makes the boundaries of the cells. What happens when I put these? Polar lipids in one. Look at this properly. Because this is the basis of how the first cell evolved. I'll come to. 
what do you see again now sorry for the color being different but the heads are uh, white they are water loving imagine this whole thing is in water i have put a lot of these lipids polar lipids in water they by themselves can come together can make micelles like i showed for the detergents okay all the hydrocarbons together or they can make bigger bodies water inside water outside two layers so that the hydrophobic yellow part is covered from water thing doesn't show see water this inside is polar is as the head groups and contains some water outside is polar contains some water suddenly you have made a food a very nice food which is stable in water it's not going to go anywhere okay. so it can still grab things which is this part things are outside these when you produce artificial you are actually things which are going into our bodies at least for not for the vaccine that um, we have but vaccine that people in the us had they had to deliver that rna vaccine some of you have heard about it those uh, vaccines that uh, we got in the us rna vaccine vaccine material was here doctor was outside made this vesicle in his liposome um, which was a drug delivery agent lot of the drugs that you will be receiving in the next few years would have to come through this uh, with this drug delivery agents in fact already uh, some okay so these are little um carriers footballs you can make inside water outside water you can have a sheet which has two sides just uh, two such sub sheets part sheet leaflets as they call upper things have water loving stuff here water loving stuff here they come together and sandwich make a sandwich with the inside of the sandwich that's called a bilayer layer bilayer sheet remember that bilayer sheet and i'll tell you how our cells are made up now from molecule world of molecules let's go to the world of living things imagine 3.5 billion years ago the world is just cold enough it's having some water and the first life is about to evolve what are the challenges well you have to think about what life the first challenge of it. what is life after all if you take a living cell it's a little region where a lot of special chemistry happens so it takes energy and materials from outside and make something very special required for life to function life to reproduce you may want to make a an rna molecule which this uh, virus has um, to reproduce itself initially it is believed that we only had rna to reproduce uh, life later on we got more stable dnas which we are made up of but basically the same thing but those are very finicky molecules and it takes a lot of energy to make them and you have to keep them somewhere so that you can reproduce a cell the challenge is in a sort of prebiotic pool of water even if you occasionally by having some lighting whatever make these molecules they are going to disperse off right you need an enclosure imagine the challenge but so that's your model of a cell and you put some valuable molecules made some valuable molecules in it in our model let's say try to put some honey in it and want to make it sweet okay put a rough honey in a bucket it will become sweet so you have a very special environment which is our model for life the sweet water however imagine what about you know it's a frustrating job because the sweetness will go away the honey will go away so you have to keep making this honey try to store it it won't get stored you need a bundle and the first cells evolved after figuring out of nature nature figured out how to make a bundle and the nature made a bundle out of lipid bilayers so it's a very basic of our existence you make a lipid bilayer boundary you have water inside you have water outside then 
can enclose important molecules such as RNA so that after a lot of effort you have made them, they just don't swim away. You need it to define inside of what you call a living thing from the outside, which is a non-living world. Okay, you take energy and material from outside, you make what you want, make inside, you throw out what you want to throw out, but you have defined a boundary. So the boundaries of life are made of limits. Okay, they more, look much more complex than the little uh, spherical thing I showed. This is what is the cartoon of a cell. What is the outside boundary is this thing. It's a cut. So I'll cut it. The top part is uh, showing the inside of the cell. The bottom part is showing the outside. This floppy thing is the lipid bilayer part. There are lots of lipid bilayers inside. There is a complex cell. You have other things called organelles, nucleus. Each has a boundary because inside the cell, also the cell needs to keep things away from each other. A mitochondria, a nucleus, a, a, cytosom, a cytoplasm, they're all different things. So a little bit of different chemistry going on at different places. If you can come close to get, keep them close together, molecule A makes something, hands it over to molecule B, which adds something to that, but they're all close together. Then finally make something that goes up. Similarly, so you have, therefore, an outside boundary, inside boundary. They're all made up of this lipid binaries. Good. So the cells, so the moment life figured out how to do that, life started flourishing because there's enough energy and materials available. If you look at how this thin thing, you know how thin this is? How thin a lipid bilayer is? You can calculate it because usually there are 16, 18 carbon chains, but I'll tell you, you don't have to calculate. The, the bilayer, the two layers together is about four nanometers. How small is a nanometer? I'm two meters tall. Nanometer is 10 to the power minus nine, one billionth of a meter. So there, the thickness is really, really thin, four nanometers, and yet it holds the whole cell. It has to be tough enough. You know, there's lots of things going on from the outside, inside, so it has to be tough enough uh, not to disintegrate. So you need to have a tough boundary, but as I have come to, if it's absolutely tough, cell is dead. The reason being, the cell needs to communicate through this boundary. Cell needs to take in things through this boundary. Cell needs to throw out things out of the boundary. What is shown here is a very special process. One of the many, many processes the cell has. It's a process of all things. How do we think? There are ions. You know what are ions? Charged. Uh, things. Sodium, chloride. If you put salt in water, you have ions of sodium, right? They need to go in inside of the cell. There's a lipid bilayer in the outside of the cell. So there are special molecules called transporters. So if you just close off from the environment, you are dead because you have to take in uh, things which are necessary things for you from the environment and throw out things which are unnecessary for you. So you have to open windows in that boundary occasion. So this is, these are the protein machines which are transporters, just like you have uh, pumps, etc. in the real life, you have transporters. These proteins actually need to open. It's shown here, I won't go into the detail, this is a closed channel, if you look at here, it opens up here. So it's sitting across that membrane and opening it and closing. Opening, closing. If the membrane was absolutely tough, very hard, it won't be able to close. So it, at the same time, it has to be hard enough to contain all the things, to you know tolerate all the mechanical disturbances that can come in, yet be flexible enough to allow these things to function. It's a dual challenge. It has to be optimal. So membrane has to be optimally soft. It's not too hard, not too soft. So how, how do I make membranes not too hard, not too soft? So you look at it. If those lipids, which has these carbon chains, if I put them together, if they could come very close to each other, those little van der Waals forces will add up, it will become very tough. So if I start with things which are just like this chain as I drew, 
you know, propane, butane, etc., pentane, those kinds of chains, hexane, etc. Then they will be very regular. Regular things you can pack very well. You know, I can give you a uh, kinky rod, and then put another one. And actually, did you bring that uh, thing? Is it there? The two. There is. Okay. So, so thank you. So this is a lipid. Okay, and it can form this kinky rod. Okay, it's a lipid with a little charge in it, and the, on the head group, this red thing signifies a charge. The rest of it is just carbon, and the hydrogens are not shown there in here. <laughs> if I put another such rod, I can fit two in. However, so it's opening up. If these rods are bent like this, the next rod is straight, the other rod is bent like that, then you won't be able to pack it so much. That's the logic nature used. It used some uh, straight chains, which are called saturated lipids, like this, and some bent chains. How do you, does it put a bend? So those of you know, there is a double bond possible. So carbon, carbon, you know, if you have um, fully saturated one bond between two carbons and three each hydrogens, but you can put two bonds between two carbons. So that's called a double bond. To put a double bond, it creates a king. Okay. So these double bonds, things, which are called unsaturated. Saturation is all the hydrogen it can take in. Put a double bond that is two hydrogens haven't been taken in. So unsaturated double bonds create these kinks, which makes the packing difficult. That keeps the membrane fluid enough. Because as I said, it has to be soft enough for channels and transporters to move in that. Okay, do their job. So you have saturated instead of unsaturated lipids, keeps it just right. Just soft. It's like you have um, uh, coconut oil. I don't know how many people use. Uh, when you were children, you used to have only coconut. The only oil I knew was coconut oil that you can put on your body, on your head. And in the winter, it was very tough because uh, I grew up near Kolkata and where the winter, you know, wintry days can go to 10 degrees and so, unlike uh, Bombay. And you will try to put something on your head, you have to take a bath, you have to go to school, and it's all hard. Coconut oil, quite hard thing. I don't know how, how many, because it's mostly saturated fat, and they come together at low enough temperature, they freeze. In, uh, in Bombay, it happens rarely, but it has happened a few, few of the years that I've been here. And you still get a kick out of it when I see my coconut oil. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so yeah, so it's a mixture of these uh, unsaturated kinks. You can see the in this diagram the unsaturation, the double bonds are shown here. The kink is not shown in this diagram. I'll show you that it always creates a kink. Okay. So there is a, an odic acid. This name comes from the length. Okay? And uh, if you have a double bond in a certain way, it moves in sort of it's called a cis double bond. It moves one way. It can create a bend. If it can move the other way, if the bond is the other way, trans bonds, then it can remain straight. So these are trans fats, these are cis fats. If I have too much of trans fats, what will happen? Uh, hard. Membranes will harden. That's why I think some of you have heard people say, don't eat trans fats. What is there? In, which food has trans fats? Well, foods which are these Vanaspati, you know, the ghee kind of things, they have a lot of trans fats. They, you can see that they are harder at normal temperature. You don't have too much trans fats because your membranes will be too hard. So you need appropriate amount of cis fats. In fact, people who are uh, concerned about heart diseases, they know about omega-3 fat. Now going to the name. The omega-3 fat is, the omega, actually it's called omega minus C, but from the end, the third carbon has a, um, an unsaturation, a double bond. And omega-3 fatty acid, which is linolenic acid, has three such double bonds, so it's a lot of um, kinks here and there. It creates a lot of disturbance, keeps your membrane fluid in. Of course, it shouldn't be too fluid, but it should have enough of it. Okay? Omega-6 fatty acid, it's in fish oil. So people say fish oil, hot liver oil, have that. Because it has this DHA, docosahexaenoid sweet. It is. And it looks like, like that. Put one of those in the membrane, the area around it 
is very, very uh, disordered. Okay? So that's why people say that this is good for you and this is bad for you. Now you understand how it is. Omega 3 is good. What? I missed that. Is omega 3 good for? Yeah. So omega 3, yes. Yeah. Just saying, but it will give you a kick. So that's good. And in fact, this is also an omega 3. Omega 3 is from the third group, there is a double bond, but there is any more down. So, this is a special kind of omega 3 thing, DHA, which is very good because it has a lot of uh, unsaturation. Okay, now that's not the only thing. That's sort of the basic ground rule of how the fluidity of the membrane is maintained, but that's not the only thing. Something else is very much a part of the membrane. Doesn't look like this long chain thing, but it can harden the membrane. In fact, body uses it. Without it, the membrane will be too fluid. And the body needs at least some regions of the membrane to be harder for some proteins to function. Like proteins need to be dynamic. They cannot also be too dynamic. So you need appropriate amount of hardness. That's given by the most famous of these lipids that everybody has heard of. Cholesterol. Okay. Cholesterol is a lipid. It has a little bit of a polar band. OH is a polar region. Rest of it is a bit. It sits in between the, the, the other lipids. This is shown in this yellow thing. This is the four circles or uh, hexagons. This yellow thing. It fits in. And what happens is that you have disordered phases, disordered regions. By putting it in, it sort of straightens things up. It's like, you know, in you're traveling in a Mumbai local and everybody is standing like this, standing like this, reading his paper and so on. Soon, the other comes in, lots of people get in, and everybody is in. Because there is no space. People have been inserted in those spaces. Exactly that. Cholesterol comes in and makes the membrane hard, which is also very, very much needed because you just can't have it too soft or too. So cholesterol is an essential part of the membrane. There is a mistake that people do. The less reduce cholesterol as much as it can. Yes, there is a reason. The hardening thing. The cholesterol is taken from the food, goes to the liver, liver puts it out so that all cells can have it because all cells need it. But during the transport, if you have too much of cholesterol, you can have the arteries blocked with your cholesterol. And in fact, there are ways to reduce Production, body also produces its own cholesterol. If you eat too little, then the body needs it. So the body produces it. And this is a model, this is a drug that was uh, found in the 60s or 70s, where the body's own production of cholesterol is shut down. They're called statins. Okay. Some of you who are at the age group that I am in, 50 plus, are already taking statins. Okay? Because you're producing the body's own production of so that's good. In fact, the statin, it came out of basic research, people trying to understand the hardness of their brain. That's why basic research is so important. And it is the all time highest selling drug. It has sold $150 billion and still selling out. The all time highest selling drug is something that reduces cholesterol in your body by shutting down your own body's ability to make cholesterol. But don't overdo it. I've seen my friends, my own friends, say, oh, my cholesterol level has gone to 68 and my cholesterol level has gone to 40. I'm doing, you know, so much, taking so much static. I said, desist. Your brain will stop thinking if you don't have enough cholesterol. So we measure. So we, um, a few years ago, got interested in this problem of hardness of the brain. Said, okay, we must measure it, see what cholesterol does, exactly how it does. So we make our own membrane. And these are the people sitting here. They make their own membrane. They measure it. Okay. Ankur Gupta here. Another Ankur there, Ankur Chaudhary. So stand up and uh, show your faces, guys. These are the two people in the lab are making this little uh, layer and measuring the strip. And how do we measure it? As I told you, these are very thin things, four nanometers. I mean, if they are a thousand times bigger, you still won't be able to see them in your uh, eyes. How do you measure the softness of such a thing? Well, you look at skin. Well, how do you measure the softness of anything? You know, how do you measure the softness of the skin or uh, the stable or something? You take something like a pin and you try to poke it. That's exactly what these two do. 
They take a pin, which of course the tip of the pin is much, much sharper than the tips of pins that you have used. It's that they put it in a machine called atomic force microscope. The name tells it that they sensor it to so little force that little atoms, single atoms can give enough force so that they can feel. They put atomic force microscopes, they do two things. One is in a, in a membrane, there are, as I said, some regions can be stiffer because of the distribution of cholesterol, etc. Some are um, less stiff and you can see the stiffer regions are taller and the less stiff region, floppy regions as, uh, as, uh, as lower in height. Or if you really want to measure the force, you poke through. You go through the thing and measure when it hits the hard surface underneath it, you know that you have hit the hard surface, you measure the force. The force is in one nanonewton range. How low is that force? Yes, but what is a newton? I mean, most of us don't know what a newton is. Okay, so who newton is, we know, but the no, how much a new, one newton of force is tough. So I am uh, 70 kgs. Okay, my weight on that floor is about 700 newtons. That is mass times gravity, gravity is. 10 meters. Uh, the m times g, g is 10 meters per second square. Anyway, it's 700 newtons. 700 newtons. I'm talking about nano newtons. So if I reduce my weight by a factor of 10 to the power 10, okay, then you'll get to that. So I'll tell you, um, an eyelash is about 20 micrograms. So that's 20, 200 nano newtons. The eyelash. The, the weight that the eyelash gives on the floor would be 200 nanometers. So it's one thousandth of that roughly or one hundredth of that is the kind of force these guys can measure. Okay, And they measure it by poking. That's where the membrane broke. And they uh, measure the force. And they can also image the areas which are tougher, which are um, less. So. This is something, let me explain. This is something that is what you're looking at is a very small area of a lipid bilayer which you have made. And the lighter yellow things are the little taller, the tougher areas where more cholesterol is. Okay? The darker brown is the softer regions. And then these regions, they also mimic the reg such regions in your cells, which are absolutely important for the cell to signal and to function. What you have done, so this is what you can measure. What you have done is ask, what if we take out cholesterol? And there are molecules okay, which can take out cholesterol, and this molecule, something called make M beta protein state, it's not important. We we'll throw some molecules in. What you see in function of time 10 minutes, 14, 22, 18, same region you keep looking at. You see the harder, taller regions are descending. This is what happens if you take too much cholesterol out. It's not good for you. Okay? It has to be optimal. Right? We can measure it. Yes. Sorry. Um, suppose uh, like what we heard uh, some quite some time back yeah. said you should have lower cholesterol. Later on they said that HDL is good, LDL should be low. What did HDL do? Okay. Let me come to that after the talk. Okay, so, so this is what cholesterol does and this is what I have told you that is something that uh, many of you have heard of little bits and pieces of. Now I'll take the last five minutes tell you about new things that you haven't heard because it's found by these guys and their friends in the lab okay, over the last few years. So we found out by looking at this, of course, we're looking for new things, you know, that's what scientists do. Okay, cholesterol goes in, goes out, and uh, it makes the membrane stiffer or less stiff. That's sort of expected. We measure it. That's very good. But that's not new. So we are looking at new things which can do stuff like cholesterol does. Either stiffens the membrane or even more interesting would be if they can loosen them, make the membrane softer. And we found some molecules in the body, very unexpected, which can make the membrane change its stiffness. These molecules are known molecules. They are names such as serotonin, dopamine. They are known molecules because they are molecules which are messenger molecules in the brain. 
If you re release too much, so neurons release these molecules to talk to each other. Okay, there is one end of the neuron, again, seconds, they slip in with the ventricles, they go out, open up, outer plasma membrane opens up, and this is the listener, this is the ear of the next cell, and it is the mouth of the first cell. So, this is the neurons talking to each other. What exactly is right now happening? That's the basic process of your thinking, of your emotion, of your happiness, sadness. This is the basic thing. In fact, if you release too much of these, you are very happy. That's what some of the drugs do. Okay. Cocaine does that, releases a lot of dopamine. That's unregulated. It's not meant to be, but also nature lets you release a bit of dopamine when you are really happy, you have accomplished something. Okay, you are feeling pleasure. That's why they are there for communicating between neurons. Okay, we found these molecules, which are messenger molecules, not thought to do anything with membranes. They go and talk to the ear, which are called receptor molecules. We found that they also can change membrane properties. Okay, again, similar pictures. Instead of that methyl beta cyclotestrine, which is an artificial thing, there is a natural molecule again <coughs> together with a membrane on the lab. This is harder regions, softer regions. There is a zoom up of this region, this region, and see what's happening. Look at the zoom up. Region. The harder region is light yellow, it's becoming there are darker regions, softer regions growing inside the harder regions and detailing with time. So the time is not here. The whole thing is, I think, 40 minutes. So you see this regions. Look at this. Same region. Okay. Serotonin, I have put in from outside. Serotonin is making membranes softer. It's making the harder regions disappear. Oh, this was a uh, very important news. We have published. That's what scientists do. They publish it in journals. Came out of the cover. Some of the guys are here um, who did this. There's a cartoon of that that you also saw in my uh, poster outside. Serotonin is like anti cholesterol. It's not directly anti cholesterol, it's not fighting with cholesterol, but it's a molecule when it goes into the membrane can actually make the membrane softer. Okay? Yeah. That's very, very interesting for many reasons. One of the possible reasons that is that some of the four. I mean, the serotonin you spoke about, dopamine, melatonin, both my yeah. Serotonin is the only one which does the. Ah, okay. That's a very good question. No, serotonin is not the only one. And Ankur Gupta would love to tell you about what other things such as norepinephrine, etc. So many of these, one family of uh, neurotransmitters that they call messenger molecules, they do it. Not everybody does it. So serotonin is not the unique one. But it belongs to, seems to be like a unique family, which are. So, this is my last slide, and I'll finish in one minute. What can we do with it? That's a very good finding, and we're looking at all biological effects of it, why it is there, why, how is nature using it. But Dev Shankar, right there, wave your hand, here. Yeah. Dev Shankar is looking at is suppose you have serotonin like molecules and use it exclusively for softening the membrane. You can't use serotonin for that because serotonin also talks, right? So too much serotonin, you are basically drunk. So make some modifications in serotonin so that they cannot talk. The receptor molecule doesn't recognize it. But it still goes and softens them. There are such molecules already known, but people don't know whether they will have any effect on the membrane because we are the ones found it. So about 10 years ago, people found false neurotransmitters. Serotonin like they they go into locations where serotonin does, but doesn't do the job that serotonin does. So he's now looking at, they're now looking at perhaps a new class of uh, molecules, which will not talk to the receptor proteins, but will just soften your membrane, like <clears throat> without talking to this. So you can shut down the talking to the receptor part and possibly can make anti-cholesterols. Okay, so this is what we are currently working. So let me just finish the story. What have I told you? What I hope you have learned. So, this is the tick array. So, like amphibians, we have amphibians in the molecule. Part which love water, or part which hate water, 
and parts with slug. And lipids are some amphiphiles. They can organize themselves in closed shapes. Just because they can produce this boundary, having water inside, having water outside, cells could evolve. So cells, the first living cells, use this as a boundary to separate in from them. Okay. So this is the first message. They're amphiphiles. They can make nice boundaries and make nice closed shells. And that's where around each of your cells. That's how cells pursue the move. This boundary, of course, needs to be tough but flexible because proteins need to operate. Okay, these proteins need to move inside. Them. They need some space. Cannot be exactly like the uh, 6 p.m. local from it. That you cannot. It's absolutely bad. You can hardly breathe. So you need to breathe it. So stop it flexible. So to make it flexible, you have unsaturated lipids. That's why people say you have your omega-3 fatty acids, etc. But also you need to be tough enough. So the whole control is a balance between the two. The other side of the balance is given by cholesterol. Inserts and makes a bit stuff. So we got interested in it and you can go and measure this toughness of this very, very fine, fine four nanometer thick thing by poking with a pin in a uh, machine called atomic force microscopy. And what we found at the end is that cholesterol is not the only thing that's controlling the toughness in the body, especially in your brain where these processes opening up, etc., is very, very important. You have other molecules which are already known as messenger molecules, they are also interacting with the membrane. So the possibilities are we can make messenger-like molecules which not carry a message, but attract, then possibly give something which is called anti -mysteries. Okay, so that's all I had to say, but let me just first introduce people who did all that, because you know I learned from them and talked to you, but they are the ones which are finding it out every day in the lab. And of course, some of you younger ones can grow up and do these things, be scientists. So, Ankur Gupta, uh, please stand up. He's the main guy guiding the project. This Ankur is uh, doing this. Uh, stand up, stand up. Ah, the, there are other tools by which we look at this cholesterol, how they make things hard or soft. Vicky, Vicky, can you please stand up? Vicky yeah. is looking at it optically. And Alpan is not here, he is there in Kolkata for his sister's marriage. And uh, the guy who has taken up with Uncle Gupta is now going to graduate with the PhD. Uncle Chaudhary is doing all that stuff. Of course, uh, I have other students here who don't do the membrane work, other protein work, which is also important. This work was started by Shimli Day, uh, who I just saw in Paris last week. She is doing fantastic stuff there. And Devanjan has come back as a as a teacher, as a professor, and a researcher in Chivandam, in the Institute of Chivandam. It's not possible, you know, scientists don't work in back home. So lots of different techniques are needed, some of which I have that I talked about, but there are some other techniques that I'm not an expert of, don't have access to. So Daniel Huster in Leipzig, who is a very frequent traveler to uh, our institute, uh, Mai Suandi and Pavel Krupa in Poland, and Gilbert Walker, in Toronto, they all have uh, their labs have contributed. Funding, of course, comes from our Department of Atomic Energy, which TIFL is part of, also the Department of Biotechnology. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, give it a minute if there are questions online, but till the questions online come, you can ask a quick question. Uh, we'll just take one question or something. We'll go out, have chai, and come back, and we can engage in a very long discussion. But if anybody has a question, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, it's different. So why don't they answer the long, the longer answer when we come back? It's not even. Okay, anything online? Uh, uh, no, thank you. Interesting things like that. As of now, no questions. Uh, so, thank you. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. So, can this uh, way of you know, uh, can you just repeat the question so that it's heard? It can avoid the side effects of otherwise which medicine causes this way of uh, messaging. Ah, okay, so uh, the question, if I understand it correctly, is that 
if we do the messaging in a certain way, can it avoid the side effects of the other medicines? Um, we don't know because we haven't invented those yet. We're just playing with it. But, um, you know, what we call side effects are uh, funny things. You do anything in a, an equilibrium thing, it's bound to disturb many things. Some we like, that's the disturbance we like, and some we don't like. It's always a balance between the two. There's a very big misconception that if you take a natural product, it has no side effects. Absolutely wrong. Anything you put in, you know, there are obviously there are toxins in the na natural, natural world, it will kill you. Snake poison will kill you. The same snake poison at small these things can also help in some things. So the point is that anything that you do to a, an existing equilibrium will change the equilibrium. You take some, you leave some, you tolerate some, and that's your side effects. So that balance has to be started. The same thing. I okay, so I think I think we'll just uh, take the break. Uh, let me just let's come back. Let's come back. Uh, so online audience, thank you for being with us. Uh, remember, Chai and Y. Keep following us on YouTube at Chai and Y, Twitter at Chai and Y. If you are want to get on the email list, please send an email to outreach o u t r e a c h at t i f r dot r e s dot in. Uh, have a nice weekend and thanks for joining. Yeah, yeah. This is only for the online audience. Please go out. There'll be chai outside. Have a cup of chai. We can continue our discussions and uh, come back in again. No problem. Good. <laughs> coffee you might have to buy, but I'm there. We <laughs> <I> have coffee. <laughs> Soon you'll want wine. Huh? Come on. So I leave my uh, laptop. Uh, oh, yeah, you can leave it here. Okay. okay.